Hello and welcome to American Music, where we live our stories through the shared experiences of musical artists, storytellers, and documentarians. My name is Randall Keith Horton. I'm your host, and today's guest is Professor Jeffrey Taylor. And welcome to the show, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Yeah, really very happy to be here. Really glad to have you. Professor Taylor is the director of the H. Wiley Hitchcock Institute for Studies in American Music. You got it. Yeah, and I have known about the Institute for decades, and I know of its importance, and I believe that our audience needs to know about the importance of the Institute. Jeffrey Taylor is professor and director of the H. Wiley Hitchcock Institute for Studies in American Music, the internationally recognized center for the study and presentation of American music based at the Conservatory of Music, Brooklyn College, CUNY, City University of New York, where he specializes in jazz and other areas of music in the United States as a professor and teaches general courses in Western music history and musicology. He is also on the faculty of the CUNY Graduate Center where he teaches doctoral seminars in American music and jazz history and historiography. His scholarly work has focused primarily on pre-1940s jazz, and his research includes many aspects of current trends in jazz and popular music scholarship and performance, particularly those related to race, gender, class, sexuality, and spirituality. His writing has appeared in the musical Quarterly, Black Music Research Journal, American Music Review, the ISAM newsletter from the Institute for Studies in American Music, and other publications. As a performer, Taylor has focused primarily on the work of early jazz pianists, such as Jelly Roll Morton, Fats Waller, James P. Johnson, and George Gershwin. What is the Institute, and specifically, how and why did it begin? Okay, it's an interesting story. It actually, uh, its founding goes back to 1971. Mm -hmm. uh, um, H. Wiley Hitchcock, who was uh, one of the premier historians of American music, musicologist, yes. um, uh, proposed this foundation with the then provost, and um, they uh, had this idea for this venture, and they put it together. and. Uh, so in 1971, they announced that we, that he was uh, uh, opening the doors of this great facility here. Uh, and um, at the time, there was very little uh, in the way of research centers or uh, really sources uh, to study American music. And mm -hmm. there was actually not a lot of interest. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but, and, and when they opened the institute, they actually, they thought they were the very first. Yes. Um, and it at turns that time, out. Yeah. Me, no. Me. At that time, it was the Institute for Studies in American That's Music. That's right, yeah. And, and Hitchcock was a director. He mm -hmm. was a director until he retired uh, from CUNY in 93. Mm -hmm. And then um, Carol Oja took it over. She uh, was one of his students at the Graduate Center. And she's now at Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, and when she moved on, uh, Ali Hisama, who's now at Columbia, was mm -hmm. with us for many years, and then I came on after Ellie left. Yes. So. Well, you have made me aware that Professor Hitchcock thought that the Institute for Studies in American Music, which, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is based in New York City at Brooklyn College CUNY, um, he thought that it was the first institute of its kind. And we'll talk in a minute about why it was formed. We'll, we'll put it this way. We'll say a bit more about it, uh, the reason why it was formed, especially from the point of view of, I won't say disrespect, but the lack of attention mm -hmm. from musicologists yeah. and you know others who would consider American music if they thought it was worthy of their consideration. But then after that, of course, he came along and his immediate predecessors and the subject just blossomed, and now we have this great resource for the studies of our own history. As a matter of fact, that's why this show exists, because mm -hmm. of the research of people like Dr. Hitchcock 
and Sister Mary Dominic, which you're going to tell us about in just a second. Could you give us a sense of what the beginnings or other well, institutions? Well, it's, it's interesting because yeah. what you say is absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it seems kind of hard to believe now, but there was very little scholarly interest in yeah. American music uh, yeah. up to this point. Uh, my, uh, my advisor, my teacher at the University of Michigan, Richard Crawford, who was a student of Wiley Hitchcock, yes, yeah, uh, yeah. describes one of the very first uh, meetings of a special interest group in American music at uh, the American Musicological Society. Exactly. And it's yeah. very interesting because he says, oh, we met in the bowels of this library. He, he, he phrases it as something like a convention of wallflowers or something like that, <laughs> you know, typical. Uh, Crawford. Typical Crawford. Crawford humor. About, you know, these people, you know, sort of outcasts <laughs> from the society talking about music that nobody cared about. Right. This uh, is American music yeah. that, that nobody cares about. Scholars don't care about it. But I'm, there I'm was. I'm listening. I'm listening. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 there, were, there were some very important things that happened around this time. The, the Institute came along and then uh, the foundation of the Sonic Society for American Music. That's S O N N E C K, not S O N I C. I C. Never thought about that way. Uh, oh, I S E E. Excuse me. Right. <laughs> Never right. thought about it that way. <laughs> um, so it, it's now. It's currently. We changed our name a few years ago to the Society for American Music. Yes, from the Sonic Society. Right. Yes. And um, but it's it's named after Oscar Sonic, who was the mm -hmm. first music librarian at the Library of Congress, uh, and. Um, wrote some of the very earliest bibliographies of American music mm -hmm. and uh, you know of course the Library of Congress uh, music collection has become a huge resource That's for right. study of exactly. American music. Yeah. Uh, so it was named after him because he was really a pioneer. Yes. Uh, so he was as you said the first music librarian at the Library of Congress. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so uh, he certainly fostered some interest. Uh, there were some other historians. Uh, mm -hmm. John Tasker Howard wrote a very important book in the 30s, a history mm -hmm. of really of classical composers in, in the U.S. primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, a big event happened in the 1950s. Um, scholar Gilbert Chase, Gilbert Chase wrote a book called America's Music. That's right. Uh, and what was important about that book is that it brought in not just the art music tradition, but also the popular music tradition mm -hmm. and mixed it in and said, we have to look at all of these. That's right. You know, we can't just look at Charles Ives or um, uh, George Chadwick right. or some of these composers. Right, the New England um, composers. Yeah, or right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, or even going back to uh, William Billings, who right. was America's first composer, first composer. In, the, yeah, in, sure. the seven, in the 18th century. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that was an important book. And then Wiley Hitchcock in 1969 published a book called Music in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, an Introduction. Yes. And in that book he put popular music and uh, art music really on equal footing, mm -hmm. which w he was really the first person to do that. Mm -hmm. And he created this duality that's still used in American music study between what he called cultivated music and vernacular music. Yes. Now most, uh, most uh, we, we've sort of changed the terminology a little bit in the mm -hmm. intervening years, but mm -hmm. that idea of this, this kind of split, especially in the 19th century, is mm -hmm. still there. So, so interesting, yeah. So very, but very interesting. But it, it's interesting to note, though, that when he, he wrote the, uh, wrote that book, there still, there really was not a sense that America's music was something worthy right. of serious study. So you've got to understand that these, these scholars were really swimming against the tide. That's right, yeah. And one of, one of the new gestures that I believe they were making was that there was a new approach to studying not just classical, but mm -hmm. also popular music in its historical and social context. Exactly. What was the social significance? What were the circumstances? We can't even say ethnomusicology. We're talking about what was happening in the immediate surroundings, the societal surroundings mm -hmm. that spawned or gave birth to a certain style here or something there. I mean, that could apply to anything like bands in right. New England or Native American music, or jazz, or what have you. Right. Let's back up a little bit, though, uh, Professor. Uh, what I'd like to know, uh, and what I think our audience would love to know was, is that the first institute 
was what? Was it ISAM? Was it the Institute for well, Studies in American Music? That's a very interesting story mm -hmm. because when um, Hitchcock founded the Institute in 71, yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, he believed it was the first of its kind. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, they published a flyer uh, announcing the opening of the Institute saying it's basically the first of its kind. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they published the very first issue of the uh, Institute newsletter which still exists, it's now known as the Amer American, Music, uh, American Music Review. Yes, yep. Um, but it started out as just a newsletter for this institution. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they had found out in the interim between the, the brochure and the uh, publication of the newsletter that they were not the first. Right, yeah. Uh, and I just wanted to read you uh, Wiley's uh, very first article in the very first issue of the Institute for Studies in American Music newsletter. And what year is Two this? Two pages, Two stapled together. The whole newsletter. 1971. 1971. November 1971. Okay, yeah. Uh, and he writes, our Institute for Studies in American Music was inaugurated, as such things often are, by a flyer announcing its establishment at Brooklyn College. The flyer began with this statement, quote, there exists nowhere in the USA <laughs> an institution or center where scholarly studies as well as musical production are focused on American music mm -hmm. in all of its diversity. Mm -hmm. And he talks a bit about the response to the flyer, people very excited that this was happening. Uh, but then he goes on to say, two of the responses, however, were startling. One was a letter of congratulations from Professor Jack L. Ralston of the Conservatory of Music at the University of Missouri in Kansas City and director of its Institute for Studies in American, American Music. Music. Right. The other <laughs> was a similarly congratulatory, congratulatory letter from Sister Mary Dominic uh, of the Dom Dominican College at San Rafael, California, yes. and head of its American Music Research Center. And what he continues on, it's, it's classic Wiley Hitchcock, beautifully uh, beautifully written. Yes. Uh, those of us who knew him could imagine him saying this. Yes. Our, our flyer's initial statement, quote, there exists nowhere, etc., was inaccurate. We are pleased to retract it, but it was a statement made in good faith and sincere belief. That it could have been made at all suggests not that the Missouri or California centers have been inactive, or even that we at Brooklyn College are party to the fabled Eastern provinciality, <laughs> but that there is a communication gap yes. in our field. Good faith and sincere belief are not the only things needed. Better communication Better is communication. too. So he was they, we were not the first. Yes. But uh, the fact that they were unaware of these other centers really speaks to the very issue. Yes. That there was not much discussion of American music going exactly. on. Exactly. One reason why we're sitting here, Professor Taylor, is that Sister Mary Dominic Ray, who you mentioned here, who was the founder of the American Music Research Center, was my boss. Right, she I knew there was a, yeah. Yeah, she brought me into the center when I told her about my idea for this series. She said, you have a very good idea there. Come to my center, and she taught me. I was there for two years. It was intense, mm -hmm. it was really intense teaching. And then she sent me to the Sonic Society meeting, 1985, where I met Professor Hitchcock. And then he became, I couldn't call him a mentor because mm -hmm. it wasn't that serious a relationship, but he certainly was an encourager. Every time I would come to New York for my Ellington work, I'd visit the Institute. Upstairs in this building where you have your offices. Mm -hmm. And he would encourage me, he would ask questions, he would tell me what to do, and when I would see him again at any meetings of the Sonic Society, he and Professor Crawford, who, whose professor he was, or whose advisor he mm -hmm. was, and I understand that Professor Crawford was your advisor. Exactly. So here we are. You know, it's, this is amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's a legacy. Yeah, in it's a just way. incredible. Yeah. So this television series. And also, series as, as, as you as you no doubt know, the American Music Research Center still very much exists Thank in you. Boulder, Colorado, Boulder, and it's, yeah. it's uh, directed by Tom Reese. Tom Reese, right. What I would like our audience to know, Professor Taylor, is that the Institute is going to be very, very much involved now, as the vision has been for decades mm -hmm. in this television series. 
When I met you, I think you told me that Professor Hitchcock had the same idea. That is absolutely right. In fact, that v that flyer that I mentioned, which was sent out when the when the institute was first established, yeah. actually gave a list of what Hitchcock hoped to do. Yes. And um, a lot of the things that he hoped to do did come to pass. Uh, some of the things are not really relevant now that American mm. music is is widely accepted in the oh, academy. I see. Yeah, but sure, he sure. did mention. Uh, the establishment of a of a television series. Yes. So you're kind of fulfilling his vision, and uh, we're we're delighted to be a part of it. Isn't this wonderful? Yeah. And I, you know, I I went to the um, Sonic Society meeting that Sister Dominic sent me to, where I met him and I met uh, Carol Olja and Mark Tucker. Right. They weren't married then. Right. They met at that conference. Yeah, that was a <laughs> that was a famous co uh, conference, a famous session. Those yes. who, who those who attended. Yes, that, and yeah. uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Tucker uh, is um, not with us anymore, but he is one of the leading scholars in Ellingtonia, the, the, the study of the music and life and work of Duke Ellington. So that's who we're talking about here. So and he was also mm. an important mentor and friend to me oh, as well. Oh, is that right? Oh. Um, he was on my dissertation committee. Oh, and so okay. he was very inspiring to me. I he didn't know that. He passed away much too early, He's, He died, it was so was sad. In his late 40s. Unbelievable, yeah. yeah. So now, here we are. I saw these scholars at the 1985 meeting enriching one another, and I, s I said to myself, why isn't their knowledge public? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't the public have the privilege of the information about American music that these scholars are discussing amongst themselves? That's why I started this project. Mm -hmm. Little did I know that Professor Hitchcock already had the idea. So here we are, and again, if you could share a little bit with our audience about the hope and the intent of your institution becoming intrinsic more so to the future of this project, I'd I'll do that. I, I just wanted to mention mm -hmm. uh, one kind of interesting anecdote, and in that when I first started going to the American Musicological Society, w society mm -hmm. which is the big uh, society that uh, we belong to, yes, sir. Um, I w what I was really struck by was there was one American music so session in the entire conference, oh. and it was packed. Oh, standing room yeah, only. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. Mark Mark gave a talk. Uh, <coughs> Tom Reese gave a talk. Yeah, sure. Uh, so you really got the sense of this just this really powerful interest yes. in this topic that yes. wasn't being addressed. And what year was this? Now? This would have been around 1986. Oh, 86. Okay. Yeah. I, I well, I wasn't I wasn't even aware yeah. of the AMS then, American Musicological Society. I see. So again, leading into what your institution can have in terms of um, participation in this series. Can you share anything about that? Well, with we're the, the vision we're of it, of future possibilities? Or? Yeah, obviously uh, the Institute has been around for quite a few years yes, now. Yeah. Uh, and our mission has changed with the times. Yes. Uh, the college has always been very supportive of us, which is, mm -hmm. which is great. Yeah. Uh, but we have always been, we're not primarily an archive, although we do have some archival materials and mm -hmm. we have a lot of recordings and mm -hmm. scores, mm -hmm. but we see ourselves primarily as uh, our mission to promote American music. Bravo. And all types of American Bravo. music. Bravo. All types. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And even going, uh, that means going beyond the United States borders. Yes. Because like the uh, Society for American Music, we see music of the Americas as something uh, sort of uh, contiguous. So. Absolutely, sure. Um, now tell us about the Woody Guthrie Centennial right. Conference that the Institute presented. Please. Well that, that was, that's, was one of our, our major events in the past few years. We yeah. did it in collaboration with the Grammy Museum out <laughs> in, uh, in LA. In LA, yeah. yeah. Um, and Bob Centelli who's uh, there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we had a day-long conference of, of um, talk or papers about Woody Guthrie. And then mm -hmm. we had a panel discussion with um, Woody Guthrie's daughter, Nora, mm -hmm. um, Judy Collins, uh, the singer, yeah. songwriter. Absolutely, who of course yeah. Is, you know. And um, then in the evening, uh, the Grammy Museum presented this wonderful concert with mm -hmm. all these lovers of Guthrie, people who were um, strongly influenced by Woody Guthrie, mm -hmm. people who knew him. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was a fantastic concert. Judy Collins was there, Billy Bragg, a great uh, 
folk protest singer. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Arlo Guthrie, who many people know was Woody Guthrie's son, his son and yep. is famous for Alice's Restaurant, the Ab movie. Absolutely. Was yep. actually yep. with his wife, who was very sick at the time, so right. he couldn't make it. Right. So we had to get a ringer, and guess who we got? Pete Seeger. Pete Seeger, yeah. exactly. He yeah. came down, he was, he was quite, uh, you know, frail at the time. But he came down and uh, <laughs> this is amazing. He, uh, he joined us on stage and he came out. There was an amazing standing ovation. Yeah. And I remember Pete Seeger saying, well, that's all very nice, but what I really want you to do is to sing. Yeah. And then he got everybody to sing along with him, which yeah. of course was his thing. Yeah. But we had actually given uh, a conference a few years earlier on um, Ruth Crawford Seeger, who uh, was a very important composer, <laughs> fortunately better known now than she used to be. Right. But we had um, all of her um, sort of extended family. We had Mike Seeger, we had Peggy Seeger, mm -hmm. we had Pete Seeger. They all came out for this, and it was it was a wonderful event. So we've had some some great connections with the Seegers and with. Um, um, the Woody Guthrie uh, people and their archive, yes, and yeah. uh, it, it's it's been a really a, a phenomenal experience. And this is all presented by the Hitchcock or the H. Wiley Hitchcock Institute, yeah, in collaboration with others. With yeah. others, yeah, for s uh, studies in American music. One final question: I am very interested in your own work, your own wow. research and performance yeah, uh, relating to the great jazz musician, big band era leader the wonderful Earl Father Hines. Can you tell us a bit about that for the end of the program? I'd be happy to. I okay. could, as I told you, I could talk about Hines for, yeah. for hours. Yeah. <laughs> but he's somebody, he really should be a household name on the order Ex of Monk or yeah. Ellington That's or right. Armstrong. Exactly. Uh, and fortunately, he's not. And there's a variety of reasons, I think, for that. But mm -hmm. he was um, one of the, the most important uh, sort of foundational figures in the history of jazz mm -hmm. piano. Yes. Uh, and uh, he also led a very important band in the 40s mm -hmm. in Chicago. It's a big band. Right, a big, big band. band. A big, big band. A big band yeah. called uh, yeah. the, the Grand Terrace Orchestra. Right, at the Grand Terrace Hotel. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's interesting because at that time, most jazz activity had really moved to New York, but mm -hmm. he stayed in Chicago, mm -hmm. and he, uh, he built up his band there too. So. He is a um, really a remarkable uh, pianist. Had a long, uh, long career. He was um, uh, 79, I believe, when he passed away in 1983, and uh, he, um, you know, he was playing up until the weekend before he died. My goodness, yeah. And uh, he was a, a one, one of the strongest players of yeah. jazz over here. Incredible power yes. in his playing, and, and an incredible sense of time. Yes, he could he could do things with time, manipulating time, making you think that he lost his place or lost lost the beat. Yeah, <laughs> things like that. He loved to do that. Yeah, and recover it exactly, and have your head swimming. Yeah, it's so he's amazing, definitely yeah. he's 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 somebody I think people should really know better. Absolutely, in influencing the likes of Art Tatum and exactly in, uh, the Teddy Wilson. Billy yes, Kyle. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to close our program today uh, with a, a beautiful um, piano solo, Stanley, Stanley's Dance.
Well, Professor Jeffrey Taylor and my friend, thank you so very much. We're my very, pleasure. Yes, and we're excited that you, as the director of the H. Wiley Hitchcock Institute for <laughs> Studies in American Music. We call it the Hitchcock Institute. We call it the Hitchcock Institute. <laughs> Hi, Sam. In Hi, other Sam. Words. Yeah. Hi. I All tried to get people to, because Wiley hated when people called it I, Sam. I, Sam. Okay. So, so Hi, Sam is even worse. It's I even worse. Right. Okay. So <laughs> the Hitchcock Institute. Yeah. Now, this is uh, at the Conservatory of Music at Brooklyn College in New York. Mm -hmm. And ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you. Thank you very much for joining us on American Music. We have been honored to have as our guest Dr. Jeffrey Taylor, the director of the Institute for the Hitchcock Institute for Studies in American Music yeah. at Brooklyn College. And we hope that you will join us again. We live our stories through public television. Be with us again. Thank you.